Okay, thank you very much, uh, Rich. Um, I feel like I'm a little too dressed up today. But, um, okay, um, again, my name is uh, Todd Kimberlane, and I'm a hurricane forecaster at the Hurricane Center. Uh, the title of my talk today is Hurricane Forecasting at the National Hurricane Center. Um, let's see if I can get this to work. All right, so um, I figured that there, there probably is no better way to start off the talk than to uh, discuss um, one of the greatest uh, catastrophes here in southern New England, uh, but it's going too far. <laughs> there we go. Um, likely the, the greatest uh, weather catastrophe here in, in New England, um, at least that, that we know of, uh, this was the great uh, the uh, New England hurricane of 1938. As you can see, it had a long track. It was a Cape Verde hurricane, long track across the Atlantic. Somewhere around the 19th, um, it's believed that it became a Category 5 hurricane, and it was a rather large hurricane. A very Katrina S or Isabel S. Uh, and uh, the hurricane, as it began to turn more northwest and northward, uh, began to encounter the Westerlies. And um, at the time, many of the forecasters at the Weather Bureau uh, thought that the hurricane was going to recur. In fact, I'd say that the majority of the senior uh, brass at the Weather Bureau thought this. And as you can see, the track even shows a slight jog off to the north northeast at one point. But there was one. Uh, forecaster, a researcher, uh, more like a, a research forecaster, uh, not, not an op operations named Charlie Pierce, and he was the one who insisted that the storm was not going to recur and that they should issue some sort of warning. Uh, he was overruled uh, in the end, and the, the official forecast that went out on September 21st was uh, for cloudy skies with a few passing showers and gusty winds. Um, so needless to say, uh, residents of southern New England were not very well prepared for uh, what was before them. So the hurricane is most notable because it accelerated northward at speeds up to 60 knots. Um, and, the, um, and the eye, which was about 50 miles across, uh, entered Long Island roughly around 3.30 p.m. that afternoon. Uh, the bear graph trace I have here off to the right is from Belport, which is on Long Island. Long Island. And the pressure here is, probably, is not the lowest. I think there was another site that had even lower, but it's about 946 millibars uh, at its peak. Um, and we know that in Providence, where we are, that the winds were about 100 sustained, gusting to 125. And at Blue Hill Observatory, which is just south of Boston and inland, I might add, uh, the winds were 121 gusting to 186. So officially at the Hurricane Center, we, uh, we've designated this as a, a low-end Category 3 hurricane. Um, as many of you know, we're, uh, we're conducting a reanalysis of the best tracks of all hurricanes. And that reanalysis is, is into the 1930s right now. But we haven't looked at this storm in, in particular. Uh, but I think it's pretty safe to say that it'll um, maintain its Category 3 designation. Here's some of the damage photos um, taken from some newspaper clippings after the storm. Uh, I know this one was taken somewhere on Long Island. Um, it's very easy to point out where, where there's surge damage, a lot of surge and wind damage. Uh, this was a large canopy road. And uh, most of all the trees were snapped in two. Um, um, these are very eerily similar to many of the destruction scenes we've seen uh, in recent years. And these, I think, are, are the most fascinating. Um, off here to the upper left, uh, this was a photo taken from the uh, Providence Journal. Um, not during the height of the storm, but probably very early on as the storm surge was beginning to move inland along the southern coast of New England. This is uh, downtown, or this is Providence with the capital. And if you look very closely, there are actually people out on the steps. Um, they were unable to uh, seek refuge anywhere else except there. Uh, I think this is just an extraordinary shot here. Um, by the looks of it, this is probably a first story building, or the, the first story of a building. So that might be, what, maybe six or eight feet right there. And we know from uh, various accounts that the storm surge rose to about uh, 13 feet. Uh, here in, in uh, downtown Providence. And here's, this is close by, I think. I'm not sure how close by, but maybe one of you will know. Uh, but this is um, some indication of exactly how uh, devastating the storm surge was. That's 
a barrier beach on the southern coast. It's a barrier beach, okay. Oh. How do you pronounce it? Mesquamica. Oh, no, no, it isn't. It's Mauritius. No, not the previous. The previous one. Yeah. Oh, previous yeah, one. How do you pronounce it? Mesquamica. Mesquamica. Mesquamica? Okay. Okay. And this uh, this picture should <laughs> is uh, should look also eerily familiar. We, we've had this. We saw this play out just recently on the Bolivar Peninsula. I think um, that shot was called "Last House Standing," and um, this is exactly what we have here on the eastern end of, of Fire Island. There's a, basically only one house left, and um, from what I know, there were 200 houses here over this small section uh, before the storm hit. Again, without with little uh, to no warning. Uh, the final damage shot that I have, uh, this is near one of the air bases, Mitchell Field, which is over eastern Connecticut, a long path of destruction. Um, I think look, most of this is storm surge, but there might be some wind damage uh, interspersed there. Um, um, in general, the storm surge along the southern New England coast was thought to be anywhere between uh, 10 and 15 feet. I do have a reanalysis. Of the surge. This is from the slosh model at the National Hurricane Center, um, putting in the various parameters, the forward speed, the radius of maximum winds, and uh, the, uh, the absolute intensity we can come up, uh, we can conduct a reanalysis of the storm uh, in terms of storm surge, and you can see that all along the New England coast we're talking about a surge of somewhere in the neighborhood of 8 to 12 feet, and this model can be up to 20 percent in error. So there is some chance that the values were locally higher. Notice here on the western end of Long Island, we have uh, some indication that the, uh, the surge might have been up to 12 or feet or higher. And here at the northern end of, of some of the bays, and um, uh, I think Buzzard's Bay is in here somewhere, but we have locally higher surges uh, on the order of uh, maybe 12 to 14 feet. So what was reported in downtown Providence, and we know from other many other accounts, that this is very much in line uh, with what was observed. And uh, like I said, on the slosh model may not be capturing the whole, uh, everything, uh, but I think this is a pretty good representation of what was observed that day. Now, of course, this was 1938, and the only thing that forecasters had to go by at that time um, was ship reports and ship logs, and they weren't very timely. Um, so whatever information they had um, was definitely very scarce. But co compare that to nowadays, Compare that to nowadays, we've seen this technological revolution in the meantime. So we start around the turn of last century, um, where we have ship logs and transmitted ship observations. And roughly around the start of World War II, uh, we see the advent of the radio saw network. Uh, balloons launched twice daily uh, across over selected sites across the continental US. Um, and soon thereafter, 1943 was the beginning of the modern reconnaissance uh, program. Um, Many of you may know the story. Um, I think there were some British uh, navigators uh, in Texas, and they were stationed there conducting some flying missions. And they saw that their American counterparts were uh, evacuating the planes, and they, they questioned you know, exactly how well built the planes were. So one of the, uh, uh, one of the gentlemen, uh, Colonel Duckworth, um, he saw this as um, maybe like a dare. Um, he, he took one of the aircraft out along with one of his, his buddies and they, they um, uh, penetrated the eye of the, one of the, of the hurricane approaching the area. And when he came back, um, I think the flight officer there, uh, he, he, he wanted to go along with them, so they went back a second time. So this was the beginning of the modern reconnaissance aircraft. Uh, aircraft. And beginning in the 1950s, we have the beginning of uh, uh, the modern radar network, which most recently was um, <coughs> Of, of course, supplemented with Doppler radar beginning in the 